Thank you. Next slide. So the present this presentation is being brought to you by SAA's Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, or TSEAS. My name is Mary Samuelian, and I'm one of the co-chairs of TSEAS. I'm joined today by Kirsten Arnold, a member of TSEAS and the current EAD team lead. Today's session is part of the call for comments on the draft for EAD 4.0. We're hoping by the, by the end of the webinar that you'll be able to have a better understanding of what a call for comments is, what the various options are for available for you to participate in the call for comments, and finally give you some pointers and show examples as to how to formulate your comments. Next slide, please. But before we dive in um, to the main presentation, I'd like to just share a few words about TSEAS in general. Um, the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, TSEAS, which you'll hear a lot, um, of the Society of American Archivist Standards Committee is responsible for the ongoing maintenance of EAD and EACCPF, including all schemas and related code, as well as the development of future companion standards. Um, just from this slide, you know, we've provided a link um, that could kind of give you additional background and work that was covered in this pre presentation and kind of what has led up to all of this um, today. Next slide, please. There are a variety of ways in which you can learn about and contact members of the subcommittee. This is, um, these links will be live in the presentation. There's a lot of ways to um, connect with us. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, because the needs of our community moves fast, um, guidelines set by the Society of American Archivists require standards be reviewed every five years for potential revision. The Standards Committee, the parent company, uh, company, sorry, the parent committee of TSAS is responsible for initiating and facilitating the development of standards and TSEAS must seek out the committee's approval before moving forward with any revision, whether major or minor. And that brings us to our current major revision of EAD. So I'll pass this on to Kirsten. And um, in the meantime, if you wanna, again, just send some chats in the chat, I'll just be monitoring those. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction. Um, as Mary said, today's sessions will be looking at the call for comments uh, on the new version of EAD, EAD 4.0, which we published last week. Uh, and we just want to start with a short introduction on the whole timeline of the revision process and where we currently stand. Um, so we started in 2021. Um, and that was essentially kind of the year that we dedicated to understanding the status quo. Um, as you will be aware, we have currently two predecessor versions of EAD, uh, which are still widely used uh, throughout the community, EAD 3, the latest version, but also EAD 2002. Um, so we wanted to get a better understanding of how these two relate to each other and what a revision would mean depending on your starting point. The next year, 2022, was dedicated mainly to alignment with ESCCPF 2.0, which was published in August of that year. Um, and this also goes along with a lot of alignment work that we have done as part of this revision uh, with other related standards in general. Um, and this also includes the exploration that TSEES is currently undertaking with regard to a standard for functions specifically. And then the last year was then focused specifically on EAD concepts. So aspects that are specific to EAD uh, and not shared with ECCPF. Um, and this brought us to the as published last week. This year will mainly be about reviewing the feedback that we get on that draft from the community. Uh, and we are starting this process essentially with this webinar and there will be other activities in this context, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, and if everything goes well, um, in the second half of the year, we will start finalizing EAD 4.0 so that we can submit it for approval 
to the relevant committees in SAA. Mm -hmm. So that's the standards committee that Mary already mentioned, but then also SAA council, as this is a major revision and also needs to go mm -hmm. to that highest level for approval. Um, and hopefully we'll then be in a position to publish the new version in the next year. Starting us off, I wanted to briefly talk you through the benefits of EAD 4.0 as we at TSES see them unfold at the moment. And I wanted to start us off with the general point that we are not developing this in kind of a ivory tower uh, hidden away from everyone, but we are developing the standards for the cultural heritage professionals all around the world and with the cultural heritage professionals all around the world. So that's why we have webinars like this today uh, and when we have uh, different possibilities to engage with the community and to get a better understanding of what it actually is that you need to do your work. Looking at the benefits of EAD, we have kind of divided that into four major sections. Um, the first one that I want to talk about is interoperability. So EAD4, as we see it, will be more interoperable with its sibling standard, ESCCPF. I already mentioned that we looked specifically at aligning both of these standards throughout the part, the revision process. But we are also aiming at enhancing interoperability across other standards that you might want to use EAD with. So we know, for example, that the colleagues in the US are often using EAD in connection with Mark 21, but there might also be other colleagues who use EAD in connection with premise as a preservation standard. So in the new version, you will find a kind of elements, for example, that have the same or similar names as they have in those other standards to make the connection clearer. And hopefully, specifically with the alignment of ESC, CPF and EAD, we will also foster greater data reuse. So if you are looking at archival description as a whole and want to combine your descriptions of the materials with your descriptions of the records creators, so EAD and ESC, CPF, Having both standards aligned more closely will help that because it helps you to reduce all the processes that you need to define in the back end for managing. The next point is sustainability. Um, so while we are not completely aligned with something like records and context, we have looked at records and context and we have kind of picked up on some of the concepts that are specifically represented in the records and context conceptual model. Uh, so you will, for example, see some elevated entity elements in the new version of EAD for agents, for functions, for places. And we also generally improve the linking between different elements throughout an EAD file, but also to external resources. Those external resources also are the main aspect of the third point, exchangeability. So as EAD um, is a standard to also exchange information, so to uh, align descriptions across different collections, across different institutions, or across different countries, uh, we are focusing this new version on supporting that in a better way. Uh, and that also means that um, more than half of the elements that you can use in the descriptive section of EAD do now support old data. So while in the current versions of EAD, for example, only the control access terms specifically allow you to include links to external vocabularies or thesauri, this is a possibility that is now extended to a lot of more elements in the new version. And last but not least, uh, we see the new version of EAD as being extensible. Uh, so while all these new possibilities are in the new version, we still allow for just simple text descriptions being included. So you can start with what might already be in your, your metadata anyway, textual descriptions, but you can step by step 
extend that and include links to vocabularies or extend it even more and use a lot of additional relationship descriptive elements uh, to have all that information directly in your EED files. And that brings me to the call for comments. Um, and just starting with the basics, uh, we wanted to just uh, provide you with two major points where you can find all information to the call for comments uh, as it is right now, but also more information that we will add throughout the next few months. Uh, and there are essentially kind of two ways to do that. One is uh, a very general way uh, via our SAA website. Uh, you will have the link on this slide and we will share that slide deck also with you, same as the recording um, afterwards. So you will have all of that available. And the alternative to that is if you are registered on GitHub, you will also find the same information on a dedicated GitHub page. So this is where we have all the documents that are currently available, either uploaded or linked from this yeah. website. So both of these places provide you as the main access point to all information that you need for EAD and for being part of the call for comments. So how and where would you get started? Um, and you can believe us, we know that there's a lot to go through. Uh, we have been working on this for the last three years. Um, so uh, we have kind of dedicated parts of our working time for this. Um, and we yeah. know that all of this goes into a lot of detail and there's even more to come. So while we have published the call for comments with the schema and some additional documentation, uh, we currently don't have a tag library. So this is something that the ED team is currently working on and which we hope to provide you with in the next few weeks. Um, we might be adding new chapters to our best practices guide, specifically on elements that we want to introduce as a new element to EAD4. And we are also working on having more example files to illustrate how those changes might affect existing EAD files. Why are we offering all this information? Uh, we want to provide information about the new version in different ways, because we know that the various community members uh, that we have work with ED in different contexts. So some of you might be working in very technical contexts, while others might be working in a more descriptive setting and mainly being involved with ED as something that the collection management system exports. And we want to give both sides of this the possibility to engage with a new version in the way that is most suitable to your context. So while there are parts in our documentation that provide you with a general overview, there also are parts in the documentation that allow you to dig deeper and to go into all the details that you might need in order to understand what the new version means for your context specifically. In short, our recommendation at the moment is start at the level that you feel most comfortable with. So either start at the general level if you want to get a, a basic introduction into the new version or go directly into the detail level if you know I need to understand all the bits and pieces of this to really kind of provide feedback and have an evaluation for my site or go at something in between. It might also be that if you are not that much on the technical side of things, you might want to wait for other types of documentation becoming available that meet your needs better. So for example, as I mentioned, the tag library, which we're going to publish um, in due time, um, if that is something that allows you to better engage with the new version, maybe wait for that. You don't have to kind of jump at things right away. And also remember, not every type of documentation will work in the same way for everyone. And not everybody will need to engage with everything to the same extent and at the same level. So this is also why we are offering these different ways to engage with the new version. 
which documents do we have and how can you engage using them with the new version? So at the moment, we have a series of blog posts on the descriptive notes blog, which is run by the SAA description section. Uh, we have published two blogs so far, and we're going to publish three more. Um, we have what we call an editorial about the new version. We have revision notes. We have, of course, the draft schema. And then we have some tables with transformation routes, respectively changes in the schema being detailed, and some initial example files. And I'll talk you through all of these to better explain what you can do with them and how that helps you to engage with the new version. So the descriptive knowledge block um, is introducing the general lines of the revision process and the new version. So these blocks are starting from the perspective of archival description, and they're adding details on encoded archival description where suitable. Uh, but they still kind of are kept on the high level. So kind of keeping it light, but still giving you an impression of what the new version will look like and support. These posts also provide links for further, more detailed reading and engagement if you want to. The editorial is similar to these blog posts, but goes into a little bit more of a detail. So the editorial is a textual description of the main aspects of the new version. So it looks directly at ED4 and describes what ED4 includes and supports. Um, it might also mention um, how that is different from the previous version and what the drivers behind it specific change were. But they are mainly kind of starting from the new version as, as the basis. So again, this is providing an overview. It is going into a little bit more detail where necessary and useful. And it also includes links to single GitHub issues where we have included all these details as part of preparing the new schema version. And essentially, um, as this is, is a text document, you can use the table of contents to navigate to the subchapter that interests you most. So there might be parts in there where you think, ah, I already kind of have that covered, um, or this is not in focus in terms of the descriptions that I'm dealing with. And you can maybe just leave them aside for, for the minute and start with something that you're really interested in, for example, if you wanted to get a better understanding of how places and place names will be encoded in the new version, you can go directly to that chapter. Um, each of these chapters mention the main elements that are relevant in their specific context. Um, they might explain um, what type of information they are meant to encode. And they will include information about any sub elements or attributes that you can use in that specific context. Most of the chapters will include, as I mentioned, a link to this more detailed GitHub issue describing um, all the facts around a specific element or element group. And you might also find links to related chapters within the editorial so that you can from one chapter follow up reading with other chapters. The next point is the revision notes. And contrary to the editorial, which starts from the ED4 perspective, the revision notes start from the ED3 perspective. So they are the, the, these notes are really looking at the changes compared to ED3 as the most recent version. So it gives you all the details of the revision. It explains what has changed on a general level. It lists elements and attributes affected by a specific change. Um, it might group them by type of changes. So if we have uh, a lot of elements, for example, where we have now enabled the links to vocabularies that will be grouped in one section. And then, at the second part of the revision notes, you will essentially also be able to follow the structure of an EED instance for element-specific changes. And again, with this being a text document, you can use the table of contents 
to navigate to the subchapter that interests you uh, and yeah. kind of jump in the way at a level uh, that you want to know more about. And this is the example that I just mentioned. So this is the chapter that looks into referencing external vocabularies, thesauri or authority files. Um, and similar to the editorial, each of those chapters will have a short introduction of the elements and attributes in question. It will explain, explain how those elements work and where they come from. So for example, have they already been there in EAD3? Um, have they been there but have been renamed? Have they been adopted from ESCCPF? Do they come from somewhere else? And then it provides further information about the context in which specific elements and attributes are available. So in this case, we have listed all the elements that now allow for those external links to be included. The next one is a little bit more on the technical side of things. So uh, the EAD draft schema is essentially the technical expression of the new version of EAD. And it's currently available in three file formats. Uh, so we have the XSD and the RNG format, which we already had in the previous version. The RNG is wrapped in the zip and tar GZ uh, packages. Um, and then we have a new version of the schema that's the NVDL. And that essentially is combining the EAD4 schema with the XHTML schema for validation. Um, and I will get to why we do that in a second. This package also comes with a schematron for more specific validation, for example, when it comes to country codes or language codes or normalized dates that you might have in your ID files. And there are different ways how you can engage with the schema directly. Um, so either you download your preferred schema type and work with this locally, or you can get the GitHub URL when you follow those links that are included here. The first option, how you can engage with the schema is essentially an option for hand coders or hand on reviewers, as I would call it. So essentially what you can do once you have the schema is you open an existing ED XML file, and that can be either ED3 or ED2002, works with both of them, in an XML editor. Um, you might want to start with a short file first. Uh, and then maybe you'll move on to a longer file in the next step. Um, and what you will need to do is you will need to associate your EAD file with the new schema. Um, and I've included the example, so to say, in terms of how this might look in an EAD 2002 file at the beginning and what you would need to change. So you would need to update the namespace and you would need to update the schema location so that your XML editor can use that for validating your file. Once you have done that, your XML editor will usually start showing those elements and attributes in your file that do not confirm to the schema that you have just updated, so to the new version of EAD. And usually your XML editor will also show you what might need to be changed. So in the screenshot that you see here, there's this highlighted option where it says attribute related encoding is not allowed to appear in element EAD. So that gives you the indication of what has changed or what needs to change if you want to make this file a valid EAD4 file. And essentially you can then go through those validation messages step-by-step, step, include comments, for example, if you have if you remove something or if you change something so that you can back can get back to that. And ideally at the end, you will end up with a valid ED4 file, including all those notes that you made along the way. And this will give you a better understanding of what you might need to change um, in your current files if you wanted to adapt them to ED4. Um, one note, if you're starting out from an ED2002 file with this, you will also have to do all those changes that already apply 
when coming from ED2002 to ED3. Uh, so one of the big examples is the change from ED header to control and changing all the sub elements accordingly. The second option to engage via the schema is more for the technical people in our community. Um, so essentially what you can do is you can take the ED4 schema and put it next to either the ED3 schema or the ED2002 schema, depending on what you're working with, and just search for an element of interest and do side-by-side -side comparison. So you can check which attributes are allowed in a specific element, which sub-elements might be allowed, and how that compares with each other. Next, we have the transformation roots table. Um, and that is kind of similar to that comparison uh, between different schema versions, because it essentially tells you what you would need to change or how you would need to change a specific element in order to get it transformed from currently ED3 deprecated to ED4. Uh, it might be that we're going to develop a similar table for ED 2002, um, but at the moment, this table is specifically looking at the comparison from ED 3 to ED 4. So it essentially lists all the ED 3 elements in alphabetical order. It names their ED 4 equivalent um, in case they still kind of exist in ED 4. Um, so it might either be kind of just a renaming of that element. It might be that the element hasn't changed at all um, in terms of the name. It might be that the element has been integrated with an other, another existing element. And then next to that in the, in the columns three and four, it gives you information about how you would need to transform the element itself and potential sub-elements. <laughs> And in the last column, it shows you how you would need to transform attributes that might be used with those elements. So again, similar to the textual um, documentation that we have, just search for an element of interest, and then you can see which changes would need to be applied in order to adapt that to ED4. Then we've got the changes in the schema table. Um, and that is similar to the transformation table, but still different because it looks more at how the specific element is defined in the schema. Uh, so it might also include optional attributes that we add in ED4, but those will not play a role in the context of transforming ED3 to ED4. Um, so it again kind of lists all the ED3 elements in alphabetical order. It names their ED4 equivalent. In this case, um, if an element is replaced or integrated with another element, um, there will not be more information on that element in this table and you will have to refer to the transformation roots table to get all those details. On the other hand, this table also lists all new ED4 elements, so all elements that have not existed yet in ED3, but will be available in ED4. And it also includes some statistical counters. So for example, if you want to understand which elements share the same attributes or which elements share the same content model, then you can use that table to get that information. And this table also links to relevant GitHub issues that document these schema changes. This is just an example on how this looks like. Uh, so you can see the function element, which already existed in EAD3. Um, and you can see as this is one of the elements that we have elevated to being a full entity element, there are quite a bit of changes and additional options that will become available with this element. And at the bottom, you can see the starting point for the new functions element, the plural element, which is gonna be a wrapper for several single function elements. 
And last, we've got the example files. Um, at the moment, we have two of them. We have a starter file, which essentially is an EAD4 dummy file, so to say, that includes all the mandatory elements, which are not that many, and mainly in the control section. Uh, with some test information. And essentially you can use that one to do some hand coding in ED4 from scratch. So kind of trying to get a better understanding of what variations and what options you have in different contexts within an ED file without having to think about kind of um, how do I transform from ED2002 to ED3 in order to get there. And the second file is an example that we have downloaded from the Library of Congress catalog uh, in January when we started preparing for this. Um, the link to the original ED3 source file is also on this slide. And essentially, we have adapted this file manually to ED4, so following the same approach that I mentioned earlier as a possibility to engage with the draft schema. Um, so in this file, you will see changes that have been applied as XML comments. And I'm just going to show you briefly how this might look like. So this is part of this file um, at the very top, um, and it relates to the element file desk, which in AD3 uh, was part of control and has now been moved out of control. Um, and renamed to find aid desk. Um, and it also comes with a few adaptations um, for its sub elements. So some of the sub elements have been renamed or regrouped. And you can see with all those comments um, how these changes have been applied. And maybe also some suggestions uh, in terms of how to deal with specific elements or attributes not being available anymore in ED4. So some of these comments um, are necessary, so to say, in terms of applying the change, while others are suggestions and there might be different ways to do the same thing. Once you have kind of found your way how you want to engage with the new version and have kind of gone through some of those exercises, the question is, how do you submit a comment? How can you kind of feedback to TSES um, on your thoughts? And there are essentially kind of two formal ways to do this and one more informal way. The two formal ways are uh, suggested when you want to report a bug. So if you found an error or if you found that there's something missing um, uh, that we have overseen, or if you want to make a feature request. Uh, and that is submitting a comment either on GitHub directly or via our web form. And then the informal option is for more general comments or questions that you might have. So things that are not specific to a certain element or doesn't, don't necessarily include a suggestion in terms of how you think things can be improved, but just maybe a general feedback that you want to give us. Uh, and this is then sending us a comment via email. Starting with submitting a comment on GitHub, uh, we have set up um, an issue template. That's how it's called on GitHub. And you can get to that uh, following this link to our schemas repository and clicking the button next new issue, uh, which will lead you to a interim page uh, where you again have to click the button get started before the actual template will show up. The template consists of different parts and essentially already includes some specific information that we will ask you to fill or that give you an indication of which information you can provide. You will have to add a title to your issue um, because otherwise GitHub will not allow you to actually post that issue. Um, and then we ask you to provide your name if you want to your organization and some way to contact you. So if you are on GitHub, um, you can either include your GitHub username or your email address. And this is mainly so that we can follow up with you if we have any questions. And then you can see a list of possible 
kind of themes that your issue might relate to. And here we would suggest that you um, use the theme EAD schema issue. Uh, and you can do that by including an X instead of the white space between these kind of square brackets that you see in the template. Once you have saved the issue, this will essentially kind of be displayed as a checked checkbox. So it's a way for us to see um, which part of our work this issue relates to. And then in the lower part, you can find uh, different sections uh, in terms of either a feature request or a change or reporting a bug, uh, where you give you some pointers in terms of information that we might need or might appreciate if you can provide us with so that we get a better understanding of what it is that you uh, suggest. And so the more precise or detailed you can be in this, the better and the easier you, we can understand what you want to include. Uh, and then we can also easier, more easily uh, address your comment in the next steps. Once you are content with what you have provided, just submit, click the submit new issue button, and then this will show up in our working list. Similarly, for anyone who isn't on GitHub, uh, we have a web form on our TSES subpage at SAA. Um, and you will find the same fields in that web form as I just mentioned for the GitHub issue template. So you will again have a field for your name and your email address so that we can back, get back to you and you will have this list where you can select category. Um, and again, we recommend that you select ED schema on that. And then um, in the lower part of the web form, you have a description and a details field where you can add a short statement or title for your comment and provide some additional uh, details in terms of what it is that you suggest. And again, in terms, if, if, if it is a bug or if you want to provide more information about the context in which you think your feature request uh, can be useful, uh, for example, if you have a, a use case from your own organization, um, then you can add that there. And at the end, you will have the submit button to actually send the web form to us. And then the last possibility is, as I mentioned, sending us an email to ts-es at archivist.org. And um, as in this example that we have included, um, these email contacts are meant for general comments or questions or any type of I just wanted to say feedback. So if you want to give us some general uh, thumbs up or um, anything in this direction, um, just um, feel free to contact us via email um, because it also helps us to understand if we are going in the right direction with this new version. What happens once you have submitted your comments? Um, Whichever way you have submitted your comment to us, uh, we will let you know that we have received it. So on GitHub, uh, this might just be a simple comment that we include in your issue um, saying, thank you very much. We will discuss it uh, at the next possible date. Uh, for submissions that you have sent via web form or email, we will reply to the email address that you provide us with, uh, just to kind of give you a heads up that we have acknowledge your comment. We will aim to do so within two weeks of receiving your comment, uh, but please keep in mind that we are a completely volunteers uh, committee, so uh, we will, might not every time be in the pos uh, position to stick to this two weeks, um, depending on other commitments that people might have. And then we will transform all your comments into GitHub issues. And we do that because GitHub is our central hub for all aspects around the revision. And it's also our internal management tool. Um, so this is the place where we gather everything that we need to do our work. So this means that we will add your issue to the major revision project. We will assign a milestone to it, we might add labels to it to indicate which part of EAD it refers to. 
and at which stage it is. Um, and essentially all issues will start in the stage review, and then we will kind of go through the different steps of the project management cycle. The EAD team will then review and discuss all the comments um, step by step in their monthly meetings, which are currently held um, the last Friday in every month. Um, and once decided, the GitHub issues will be updated accordingly. So we'll include a short note um, in terms of uh, confirming that we have accepted your suggestion um, and what the next steps would be to implement them. And in case we have decided not to accept your suggestion, uh, this will also be included on GitHub. So we will include um, some reasoning while we think that might not be uh, the best way to go forward and we might include potentially an alternative solution. Um, and again, for comments that have been submitted by the web form or email, uh, we will provide you with that information via email so that you are kept in the loop independent of which platform you are using. And also in terms of the independence of platform aspect, uh, we aim to provide um, an overview of the comments received and the status in regular intervals, um, also in a non-GitHub context. So again, the recommendation to keep an eye on our SAA website for news in this regard. Um, and I've included the link to that again on this slide here. And that brings me to the end. I'm just kind of trying to see if there are any questions from anyone. Um, and I can see one question in the chat. Uh, will you group similar issues or do we need to keep abreast of the issues already entered to not enter duplicates? Um, so in GitHub, um, so let me put it like this. So um, with the labels that we have, um, that will might, will already kind of give us, give you an indication in terms of the context uh, and kind of the group in which a specific issue has been applied. So um, on that GitHub page that I mentioned earlier, where we gather all the information for the revision process, we could, for example, also kind of um, include some entry links, so to say, in terms of if you want to provide feedback on, I don't know, sub elements of the um, did element, uh, then you can do it here. Um, so maybe to, to make that that easier. Um, otherwise, there's always a possibility to search uh, for GitHub, uh, for issues in GitHub. So if you're commenting on a specific element, uh, you might just kind of want to st start out with searching for that element name to see if someone else has already submitted something on that. Um, so that might also a way to, to see that uh, duplications can be avoided. Um, and I think otherwise, it's just kind of one of the things that the ED team will look out for. So when we go through mm -hmm. the issues uh, submitted, um, we might kind of combine issues that deal with the same uh, aspect. Um, then we've got another question, uh, timeline for the transformation route from ED2002 to ED4. Um, not a specific date, uh, but I would say within the next month to have that available because we know that there's a big part of the of the community that also still is using AD 2002. Uh, so this will certainly be something that is kind of um, on the top of our to-do list. Any other questions from anyone? If this is not the case, I just want to end with um, 
one more announcement, so to say. So similar as the session today, we are planning three more open sessions as part of the call for comments. Um, we will be sharing registration information as well as topic information about them next week, uh, but you already have the dates um, at which those will happen, um, 22nd of May, 18th of June and 9th of July. Um, and we have tried to kind of distribute them in a way in terms of the timing um, that we allow all different parts of our community around the world to at least make sure they can attend one of them. Um, there are some overlaps, of course, between different time zones, and you might be able to uh, attend several um, of these open sessions. But all of them will be recorded and will be shared on SAA's YouTube channel. So even if something happens at your night time, uh, you will still be able to revisit that conversation um, and find all the details around that session accordingly. And I think with this, I will at least stop sharing the slides. Um, so just to make sure that I can see everything in terms of maybe raised hands or any further comments, um, but I don't think we have any at the moment. So I think it's just uh, for Mary and me to thank you very much for your attendance today. And um, yeah, we are looking forward to hearing what you think of ED 4.0 in the next few months. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.